there, you awesome bipeds, quadrupeds, even the occasional dinosaurs. It is I, Little Wolf, and welcome to my den. Go ahead, come on in, but please wipe your paws before entering. And the cauldron is going and the water is bubbling, so you can have your choice of tea, coffee, or hot chocolate. I myself am now indulging in a cup of hot chocolate, or uh, it's coffee mixed with hot chocolate, so it's a little bit of like a poor pup's mocha. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys for your patience on me not really putting out videos over the last week and a half or so. But it was just one of those times where I was doing quite a bit and watching a lot of stuff, but just nothing seemed to really jump out and grab my attention to say, hey, we should make a movie on this, or make a podcast on this, or anything like that. And usually that's how I do my videos. It's something that just kind of jumps out at me and says, hey, you like this, others might too. But I digress. Um, I spent the last week and a half kind of getting lost in the show Doug from Nickelodeon's Nicktoons. I watched a bunch of the Goosebumps episodes and um, R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour and Are You Afraid of the Dark? And those were a lot of shows that I really liked as a kid and I'll probably do some videos later on more in depth into those things but for some reason it just didn't kind of jump out just yet as something that I should make a, a video on but it also made me want to look up some of the older cartoons that I grew up watching um, and one that stuck out in my head was the movie The Last Unicorn. And I did do some digging around with the Oracle, and I was able to find a copy to watch online, and I'll probably stick a link in the description here later on. And if you haven't heard of The Last Unicorn, it is definitely up there on my animated movies, it would have to be in there within the top five at least. Um, the number one for me, of course, would be a Goofy movie, and then followed by Lilo and Stitch, just because they really resonate with me a lot. But The Last Unicorn was a animated movie that, oddly enough, came out in the year I was born in 1982. Or at least that's what the Oracle is telling me. And it is such a fun animated fantasy movie. You have unicorns, you have wizards, you have heroes, you have dragons, you have witches, uh, and everything else that's kind of mixed in there, a, a singing, talking butterfly, and everything else. But oh my god, it's such a fun movie to just kind of sit down and get lost in. I would rank it around the area of like the animated Hobbit movie, where that is just as fun too. But let's go ahead and jump to the Oracle real quick and will give you a quick overview of what it's about. The Enchanted Tale of the Last Unicorn. Upon hearing that she may be the very last of her kind on Earth, a unicorn, played by Mia Farrow, goes in search of others like her. Her quest won't be easy as it leads her straight to the evil King Haggard, played by none other than Christopher Lee and his infamous Red Bull. And the journey is made even more complicated when, to protect her from the envious wrath of Haggard, a spell is cast 
to turn the unicorn into the Lady Amalthea, a beautiful young human woman. But with this new body comes new thoughts and feelings such as love for Haggard's son, Prince Lear, played by Jeff Bridges. Will Amalthea get lost in her new body? Will she meet the fate of the other unicorns? Or will she, or will she be able to defeat Haggard and his Red Bull with the aid of her friends, Smendrick, the bumbling magician, played by Alan Arkin, and Molly Crew, played by Tammy Grimes? From the author Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass of The Hobbit comes a magical adventure with an all-star cast including Mia Farrow, Jeff Bridges, Christopher Lee, Alan Arkin, Angela Lansbury, Robert Klein, and unforgettable music played by the band America. And you do pretty much get an overview of what happens in the movie from that, but it's one of those times where, yes, you can hear about things happening in a movie, but when you see things happen, is what makes it more fun. And the movie itself starts off with a couple of hunters that are riding on horseback through what looks like just a regular forest. And they notice that they can't find any animals to hunt, and one of them mentions that and the other says it's because there is a unicorn in this forest and the forest is uh, somehow magical because the trees never die and I think somehow the animals never die and things like that. It's never winter in that area. It's always kind of a spring summerish time. And the older hunter does mention that um, she could possibly be the last unicorn on Earth because no one else has seen any other unicorns in the world. And the unicorn herself is there and she hears them talking about this and watches them ride off. And she starts to wonder, am I really the last unicorn on Earth? And as she's pondering this, Along comes a little butterfly who I think is so much fun in the movie because he quotes poems and weird songs and even weird things like off of the cover of a matchbook. And she asks the butterfly, you know, do you recognize me? Do you know who I am? And he goes on these weird little tirades, like I said, just saying, you know, I know who you are, you're Rumpelstiltskin, and weird things like that, and does songs like See You Later Alligator, or Have You Seen the Muffin Man? And she finally kind of gets irritated with the butterfly, and starts to walk away, and then the butterfly suddenly becomes a little bit more serious, and starts telling her about a creature called the Red Bull. And he went all around the Earth and basically herded all of the unicorn into an ocean for a king, King Haggard. And if she stays in her forest, she'll be safe. But if she does go looking for him, there is a chance that she might either get captured by the Red Bull, or she may somehow die along the way. But she decides, okay, I do have to take off and try and find the other unicorns and find out who this King Haggard is, and find out who the Red Bull is. And throughout a lot of this, um, you hear really good songs from America playing in the background. Um, there's one that's um, called Walking Man's Road, and that's playing as she's traveling along. And there's just like a weird quick little montage of her traveling through different lands. And you 
also start to realize that humans haven't seen unicorns in so long that they no longer see her horn. She's laying beside a dirt road and a farmer is going by with his uh, wagon and he looks over at her and he just sees a beautiful white mare. And so they just cannot see the horn anymore. She's just a horse to them. <clears throat> Sorry. But later on, she does come across another farmer who tries to capture her so he can take her to the fair and win a prize because she would be the most beautiful mare anywhere. And she gets really really mad about just being called a horse, which, you know, I can understand. That'd be like calling a wolf just a, a feral husky, so that'd be kind of an interesting thing. Boop, sir. And, you know, so she's traveling along, and she falls asleep at one point, and there's a traveling carnival run by Mommy Fortuna, and yes, that really is her name in the movie, and this is played by the ever-wonderful Angela Lansbury, but what she does is basically she tries to capture animals and put them in cages, and she's able to cast spells on different animals so they can appear to be something that they're not. Like, there's a giant serpent that is supposed, uh, I think it's the Midgard serpent, and its coils and everything are so long that it could wrap around the earth if it really wanted to, and there's a creature that's supposed to be a dragon, and I forget what kind of creature that actually is, but it turns out that these are just regular animals that she's putting a spell on to make other people see those creatures. Um, there's the, like I was saying, with the Midgard serpent, it's just a regular, like, python that she's made it to look like a giant dragon snake thing. Um, there's a giant ape with horns that just turns out to be a little monkey with like a twisted foot. But somehow she was able to get her hands on a real harpy. And for some of you out there who really don't know what a harpy is, I'm pretty sure most of the people that listen to my channel probably do. But it's basically like a giant bird that has, uh, basically, well, if you've seen the movie Carrie, they have dirty pillows. Yes, we'll put it that way and leave it at that. Um, but they, and it's a real harpy that she, Mommy Fortuna had captured while it was asleep, and the same way with the unicorn, too. And she just kind of travels around to different towns and shows off all of these creatures to the people. And it, this is where you also meet Schmendrick the Magician, who is basically trying to become a real wizard but he mostly just kind of does card tricks and weird little, like, sideshow-type magic to be able to stay with the carnival. And he, since he is a wizard, can actually see that the unicorn is a unicorn. And to make the other people see that the unicorn is one, she puts a false blue glowing horn in front of her other horn for the people to see and people have not seen unicorns in so long like I've said that there's just so many people standing in awe and wonder at that they're seeing a unicorn 
and it does even show almost like a Virgin Mary type character looking at the unicorn and you just see tears streaming down her eyes because she's so happy she finally gets to see a unicorn. But it's just so interesting to think that of all the creatures there, there are two that are real, and that's the unicorn and the harpy. And Schmendrick the magician does explain to her, yes, Mommy Fortuna is a real witch, but she also decided to just instead of um, doing whatever other witches do, and that day and time she's decided to start her own traveling sideshow and show off different creatures and put spells on them so other people will see what she wants them to see. But when it comes to the harpy and the unicorn, it was a bad idea because he says the truth hurts her magic. And Schmendrick knows what she is, and he knows he has to help get her out, and she's stuck inside of a wagon with bars on it and everything else. And so, he does try casting a couple of different spells. Um, one of them at one point makes the box itself disappear, and the unicorn looks behind her and she sees her forest that she had left behind there's all the animals standing there watching and so that fades back away and she's back inside the box and his next one he tries to turn the bars into brittle old cheese that he can just crumple and scatter away the bars but somehow the bars are repelling the magic so he just winds up burning his hands on them somehow and he tries another spell, and it actually makes the box itself to start to shrink. And the unicorn is kind of freaked out, of course, because she thinks she's going to get squished inside this box, turning into another tiny box and squish her and kill her. But he's able to stop it, and she asks him, you know, do another spell. You know, it was the wrong one that you just did, but it was real magic. And he also reveals, you know, I'm kind of a bumbling wizard, so you're just gonna have to get along with knowing a second-rate pickpocket. And he wound up taking the keys from another carnival person named Rook, and he says that, you know, I told him a riddle earlier and the guy is such an idiot it'll take him all night to try and figure out the riddle or he'll give up by morning and the riddle itself is one that some people will know from Alice in Wonderland of why is a raven like a writing desk and while he was telling him the riddle he wound up pickpocketing him and taking his keys and so he's able to free the unicorn and after he frees her Rook shows up and notices that he took the keys and they start having a scuffle on the ground and he's saying you know I'm going to tell mommy Fortuna and she's going to take some barbed wire and turn you into a necklace for a harpy and he's laying on top of him trying to strangle him and things like that and while this is going on the unicorn actually goes around to each of the different um, boxes and there's at least like around eight different containers and she lets loose all of the other animals. And as soon as those animals are let loose, the spell is broken, uh, and they turn into their regular animals. There's an old toothless lion that was supposed to look like, I wanna, it's the lion that has the scorpion's tail and the wings and everything else. I just kind of forget what that's called right now. 
and if you remember, go ahead and put it in the comments below. Um, the Midgard Serpent turns into its regular serpent -y self. The giant ape turns back into its own little monkey form, and you see it kind of scampering along with a little bandage around its one foot that's twisted. And she walk the unicorn walks over to the harpy, and the harpy's telling her, you know, you should let me go because we are sisters, you and I, with them both being magical creatures that shouldn't be caged. And everyone is, or at least Shmendrick is yelling at her, you know, don't let the harpy loose because she'll kill you. And of course, the unicorn does let the harpy go. And the harpy starts to fly up into the air and starts coming back to attack the unicorn. But the unicorn's able to repel it with her horn and magic. Uh, of whatever magic unicorns have. And as this is going on, Mommy Fortuna notices that it's happening, and she comes along and starts yelling that um, there's no way that the unicorn and the harpy could have freed themselves alone, and how it doesn't matter that they're free, they'll always remember that they were captured by her and the harpy catches sight of Mommy Fortuna and lands on her and, you know, just kind of sheds her up this mortal coil. And Schmendrick and the unicorn are trying to get away, and Schmendrick is like, run, we should run. And one of my favorite lines happens right here, which is where the unicorn says no. You sh you should never run from anything immortal, it just catches their attention. And I'm not really sure why, but as a kid that always stuck out to me as one of my favorite lines in the movie. And I'm gonna kind of fast forward a bit because I know I'm kind of getting lost in the retelling of what's going on. And like I said, I know that me telling you what happens and you watching what happens in the movie will be two totally different things. But they also, on their travels, they wind up getting picked up by a den of thieves, um, run by Captain Cully, I think his name is, like Willie Cully, because uh, Molly Grew White calls him Willie at some point. And the wizard is captured by them, and they're sitting around a fire, they're eating, and it's so bad that they're eating something called rat soup, which I'm thinking they just boil a rat in water, and then they eat the broth of it, which, I don't know, that doesn't really sound too appetizing, even for a little wolf. But Captain Cully has his uh, minstrel there and he wants him to play a song of what happened of a different adventure and you see some real magic from Schmendrick right here because in order to get some of the other thieves away from him he casts a spell and he says magic do what you will instead of, you know, trying to make his own spell and everything else, he wants the magic to choose what it wants to do. And what the magic does is it conjures up, um, like ghostly images of Robin Hood, Maid Marian, the Friar, and all of these other different characters from the Robin Hood story. And I'm guessing in this universe, Robin Hood is a real character, because all of the other thieves start to chase them through the forest, asking him, you know, can we join your band of merry men? And as this is going on, Schmendrick's laughing up a storm because he realizes he can do real magic. And of course, Captain Cully is not excited about this at all. Him, and I'm guessing it's like his right-hand man, um, I think his name is Jack, I forget right now, um, 
but they take him and they tie him up to a Douglas fir. Or at least that's what Schmendra calls it later on, because some interesting stuff happens here. And they're going to try and take him to different towns and see how much money they can get selling him to whoever will buy him. And as he's tied up to this tree, he, he casts a weird spell, and somehow the tree itself comes to life. And so, it's telling Schmendrick that, oh, you love me, love me, love, 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 love. And there's nothing more beautiful or eternal in this world than a tree's love. And it's almost in that kind of an accent too, but, you know, as a female. And he calls out to the unicorn to come and help him, and the the tree itself starts getting mad, saying, you know, No, she will never have you, that hussy. And it's, it's just one of those scenes where it's just really funny, because he's trying to get away from a tree, and this magic messes up as usual, and doesn't go the way he wants it to. But the unicorn does wind up freeing him from the tree, and this is where Molly Grew enters the picture. Because as they're walking away from where they were, Molly Grew steps out of the forest a bit and says she knows what was going on. And she looks at the unicorn and stops for a moment. And you can realize that she can tell what the unicorn is versus the other humans that are around. And I'm guessing maybe Molly is maybe in her mid-40s, somewhere around there, where she's not a young woman, but she's not an old woman. But she does get upset at the unicorn because she says, you know, How dare you? How dare you come to me now when I am this? Where were you when I was young? Where were you? Where were you when I was innocent? And she starts crying. And Schmendrick asks her, you know, can you really see what she is? And Molly turns to him and says, if you've been waiting to see a unicorn for as long as I have, you would always be able to tell what one looks like. And Schmendrick mentions that she's probably the last unicorn on the earth and they're on a quest and Molly says it would be the last unicorn to ever walk up and meet Molly Gru and Schmendrick says you know all right it's time to go let's go on our quest and Molly decides she's just gonna go with them and you know, Schmendrick's not really all happy about that and everything else, and he says, what? Well, we can't bring you, it's gonna be too dangerous, and blah blah blah, the usual, like, male chauvinistic type stuff. And Molly says, you know, I can't come along? Are you sure about that? Why don't you ask the unicorn and see what she says? And she asks, you know, so where is it that you're headed? And this is where... He says, uh, Schmendrick says, we're heading to King Haggard's kingdom. And Molly says, well, you know, you're going the wrong way. We're going to have to turn around and go in the other direction. And the wizard says it was a shortcut. Which, yeah, right. Because, you know, men and asking for directions, even back then, wasn't a big thing. Uh, but then, they do finally make it to King Haggard's castle, and I always love that a lot of my favorite movies, when it comes down to it, and I look at the people who are in the movies, Christopher Lee is somewhere tucked in the area with the cast of actors and everybody else in it, because, I mean, he was in the Horror Express, 
he was in a funny musical movie called The Return of Captain Invincible, where he plays a bad guy. Um, the old Hammer Horror Dracula movies, which I still need to see some more of, but he plays the voice of King Haggard. And oddly enough, some of my friends don't really know who Christopher Lee is. And to a lot of them, I say, what is up with that? How can you not know who Christopher Lee is? That's like saying you don't know who Vincent Price is. That's like saying you don't know who Raul Julia is. And just old actors who are amazing, Peter Cushing and all of them. But Christopher Lee plays an amazing King Haggard. He lives in an empty castle where he only has one wizard named Mabrook, and he has a son named Prince Lear, and as far as I can tell, those are the only people living there. There's also a one-eyed cat with a peg leg and an eye patch who lives there too, and he turns out to be one of my favorite characters, but he learned throughout the rest of the movie bits and pieces where King Haggard just wasn't happy with things. He had a lot of money, he tried throwing many extravagant balls inside of his ballroom in the castle, he tried having big dinners, he tried all of these different things, but for some reason it just did not bring him happiness and joy. So, the only thing that did bring him happiness was to, um, as a young king, he went out into the forest and he saw a unicorn, and just seeing the unicorn actually made him happy, and somehow he got in contact with the Red Bull and told him, you know, I need to have these creatures because they're the only things that really bring me true joy. And so then the Red Bull, <laughs> oh my god, now I suddenly want to say Red Bull gives you wings. I'm sorry. But the Red Bull goes throughout the earth and herds up all of the other unicorn and push pushes them into the sea in front of King Haggard's castle. And so every time King Haggard looks out his window, he can see the ocean and he can see the unicorns riding on the waves and he says it's the only thing that brings him happiness. And he also has his son, Prince Lear, who is voiced by Jeff Bridges. And you find out too that that's not really his son. It was some peasant's son that they had left out on a doorstep and King Haggard thought, you know, I never had a son and I'll just kind of give this a try and see what happens. And he winds up raising Prince Lear and he says, you know, it was happiness for a little bit, but it quickly disappeared. And it's like, you know, what is that, you know? How can you decide, yeah, I'm going to try raising a kid and see how that goes. And it's, oh, it's not for me. It's not making me happy anymore. Um, no, it's not a video game. It's not anything like that. It's not a book. It's not raising a kid. Yeah, it's not just something, oh, it doesn't make me happy anymore, let's, let's just let it live its own life type thing. Oh my lord, it, it's just one of those areas where it's like a WTF moment. But Prince Lear winds up staying there with them. Or he's already there, I'm sorry. And they figure out that they're supposed to talk to a dead skeleton and try and get it to answer a question of how to get to the Red Bull's lair. 
and they stay there for quite a while. And what happened just a bit before they made it to the castle was that the Red Bull does show up and it sees that there is one more unicorn that it did not get. And so, as the Red Bull is trying to attack the unicorn and herd it into the ocean, um, Schmendrick once again says, you know, magic do as you will, magic do as you will. And the magic changes the unicorn into a human female. And she becomes the Lady Amalthea, who is supposed to be the niece of the wizard. And in this new female form, or this new human female form, the unicorn is not happy at all, because she says a line, um, Yes, I am scared of the Red Bull, and I don't think I could fight him and win later on, you know, but I am more afraid of this human body because I can feel myself rot, or I can feel it decay all around me. And as the Lady Amalthea, as they're at the castle, Prince Lear sees her and says she's the most beautiful woman he's ever seen, and yeah, she's really pretty and everything else, but I'm also maybe guessing throughout the time that there aren't that many women there because there's like nobody in the kingdom of uh, King Haggard's area, at least not that I could see. But Prince Lear goes through all of these different things to try and win the affections of Lady Amalthea. He actually slays a dragon and tries bringing her the hide of the dragon. He tries so many different things. He tries writing her a poem, and he's not good at writing a poem. Uh, here's where another kind of uh, memorable song happens where the words in itself, he's saying, you know, all I can say is that I love you and that's all I have to say because he, he says in his song, you know, I, I, with all the feelings I have about you, I could write a whole book, but every time I try and put it down, I barely even get a chapter done. And he, he even says at one point to Molly, he felt sorry for killing a dragon because Lady Amalthea didn't like the gift that he gave her of the dragon's hide. And it's just kind of funny because he's like, you know, I felt sorry for killing the dragon. Yes, I felt sorry for killing it. It's just so much fun to watch him try and get the affections of Lady Amalthea. And he's peeling potatoes at one point with a potato peeler or it might have even just been a knife at that point, I'm guessing. Um, it's really hard to really tell what time period this is supposed to be in. But he keeps cutting towards himself and he keeps nicking himself in the fingers and saying ouch and everything else. And finally Molly just kind of gets tired of that and she says, cut away from yourself. It's just one of those things where it's like, you know, it should have just been common sense, cut away from yourself so you don't hurt yourself with the knife while you're trying to peel a potato. Potato, potato, potato. But, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like, it's also something that taught me as a kid, always cut away from yourself. And with this being a movie that by now is as old as I am, which in dog years is six and a half years. Uh, to you who are good at math and good at looking things up on the Oracle, you could probably type it all in there and figure out how old I am. Or if you listen to the Swordsman Happy Birthday stream for me, you know how old I am. But, you know, I'm not going to say it again. But just watching this movie as a kid, was always so much fun for me. 
and all the different things that happen. Um, the cat, like I said, is one of my favorite characters, and somehow it's a talking cat. Uh, there's no explanation to it, there's no backstory to it or anything else, but the cat is just so much fun. Because, like I said, it has one leg that's a peg leg, it has an eye patch, and it's always speaking in riddles when they ask it something. Because uh, Molly at one point is talking to him and says, you know, we have to try and get to the Red Bull's lair to try and figure out how to get all the other unicorns. And the cat can actually see through the magic and tell that the Lady Amaldia is a unicorn. And he says, you know, no cat out of its own fur would ever be deceived by appearances alone. And I just love how he talks, too. And he explains to Molly the way to get to the Red Bull's lair is when the clock strikes strikes the right time and the wine drinks itself is when you're going to be able to get to the Red Bull's lair. And Molly gets all fed up with this and kind of says, you know, why is it you always just talk in riddles and say stuff like that? And he says, because, madam, I be what I be, and no cat out of its own fur ever gave a straight answer. Ha ha. And at that point, he takes the eye patch that he has and flips it over to the other eye. And you realize he has two good eyes, but for some reason decides to wear an eye patch anyways. And I just always loved that cat as a kid. And they do figure out how to get into the lair of the Red Bull. And Schmendrick has to get this one skeleton to talk, and the skeleton is just so much fun to sit there and watch, because he's just, like, having a weird good time with Schmendrick, uh, making fun of him as a wizard and everything else. And one of the things, when the wine drinks itself, is where this part comes in. And it's just odd to watch because Molly had to look through the castle to see if she could find any wine to be able to get the skeleton to drink it, but she could only find water, and she says, you know, I thought maybe if you had water to start with, Schmendrick, you could do something with it, and it's just kind of one of those weird, like, coming to Jesus type moments, you know, turning water to wine type thing, and a wizard doing that, and that always stuck out to me as a kid, too, because he has to turn water into wine, and that just kind of has a weird, uh, like I said, religious reference with Jesus, the all savior Christ, but the spell doesn't really go the way it's supposed to, and Schmendrick has an empty glass, and it looks like one of those old, like, science speakers where it has that bulging bottom part and a long neck going up. So it kind of looks like one of those beakers, but it's like a water beaker, I'm guessing. Me me. But it's just interesting to see how this part plays out, because the skeleton starts getting really interested and wants the empty bottle and Schmendrick is saying you know why do you want the empty bottle you can't taste anything you can't eat anything and the skeleton says because I can remember I can remember what it tastes like and they do talk the skeleton into telling them you know when is the right time to be able to go into the clock because there's an old busted clock, and it's like an old grandfather clock that has like weird bat wings sticking out the side of it, or dragon wings. I, I have to rewatch the movie again, but um, and the clock face is all 
broken and disheveled and I think like what do you call it the dinger inside of it doesn't really seem to be working right so it's one of those clocks that's stuck at a certain time and so you know a broken clock is right twice a day type thing and the skeleton explains you know that clock will never strike the right time so you just to get to the red bull's lair you have to walk through time and the clock is just a representation of time, so if you step through that, you're stepping through a portal that is time to get to the Red Bull. And it, it's just weird type one right there. And uh, Lady Amalthea is there with Molly also. And after they hear the information of how they're supposed to get to the Red Bull, uh, Molly says, come with me, my lady, we have to go find the others. And that's where the skeleton itself realizes what Lady Amalthea is, and he starts calling out for King Haggard, saying, you know, Haggard, Haggard, unicorn, unicorn, Haggard, Haggard, they're going for the clock, they're going for the Red Bull, unicorn. And Haggard, at this point in time, he has pretty much already guessed what Lady Amalthea was. Because when they first arrive at the castle, too, he uh, can look into her eyes. And at that point in time, she was only barely a human, maybe a day or two of being a human. And he looks into her eyes, and he can see the forest that she came from and the animals that she left behind and later on when she's more human than that um, she also had a weird mark on her forehead which is where the horn was and later on Haggard's talking to her and he he's realizing she's becoming more human because the mark is gone off of her forehead and he looks into her eyes and he can see his own reflection staring back at him through her eyes. And they make it into the clock and somehow Prince Lear has seen what was going on and he follows him. And Haggard destroys the clock to, um, get rid of the entrance to the tunnel, which I don't see how that really did too much, because, like, the tunnel is right underneath King Haggard's kingdom, or his castle, and his castle's right there on the side of a cliff, and one of those things, too, where I look at it, it's like, who would ever really want to build their house right next to a cliff, especially right next to the ocean? Because you already know that there's going to be erosion. Erosion is a thing. It's going. The ocean itself is going to bash against the cliff. And slowly but surely, don't call me surely, but it'll slowly but surely eat away that cliff. And soon, the whole area is going to crumble down. And it's going to be a long time before this happens to that castle. But it's just one of those things where you look at that and it's like, is it really a good idea to build anything next to a cliff ever but the red bull finds them inside of the tunnel and schmendrick at this point actually instead of saying magic do as you will he actually says an actual um spell and it does turn amaldia back into a unicorn and she charges out the tunnel with the red bull chasing after her and here you have kind of a quick showdown between the unicorn and the red bull and molly's shouting at schmendrick to do something to help her out and schmendrick's like you know not all the magic in the world now can save her because this is something she has to kind of do on her own almost and molly's saying, you know, then what good is magic good for and everything else if you can't help out a unicorn? And he says, yeah, uh, magic right now can't help a unicorn. It's not that job. It's the job of a hero and Prince Lear, who has loved 
Lady Amaldia says, yes, it is a job of a hero, and he tries stepping in between the Red Bull and the Unicorn, and the Red Bull just charges him, knocks him over, and I'm guessing kills him? Because it's just kind of hard to tell. He falls face first onto the beach and tries to get up once and then just falls over again. And the Unicorn sees this happen and oh my gosh, it makes her mad. Madder than anything else. And she starts uh, fighting back at the Red Bull with her, with her horn and the magic of her unicorn and starts pushing the bull back into the ocean. And as this is happening, you start to see all the other unicorns start coming out of the water and just covering the Red Bull. And as that happens, you see, I, I cannot really guess at how many unicorns are coming out. But it's enough to shake the ground so much that Haggard's castle falls apart and he falls into the ocean. And he's yelling out at the unicorn saying, You were the last. I knew you were the last. And he falls into the ocean with the rubble of his castle. And that's the end of Christopher Lee in this movie. And the unicorn looks over at Prince Lear and brings him back to life and a little bit of time has passed because now Schmendrick and Molly and Prince Lear are standing on a road and Prince Lear is saying you know I wish I could have told her exactly how I felt and how I truly felt about her but the wizard's like you know you don't have to tell her anything because she knows how you felt because of all of the unicorns in the world she's going to be the only unicorn who knows the feeling of regret and true love which is a very interesting idea to think that there would be a unicorn that could regret or any immortal being and to regret something like that would be very interesting and he also says, you know, long after you are gone and humans are gone and humans kind of become fairy tales to the rest of the world and books are written by rabbits that, you know, this unicorn will remember what your heart was like. And with that, Prince Lear says goodbye to Schmendrick and Molly, and he rides off to go do whatever a Prince Lear is going to do with the rest of his life. And Schmendrick and Molly decide that they're going to travel together. And as it's nighttime and the fire's gone out, Schmendrick kind of wakes up and he sees the unicorn watching them. He walks up and starts to talk to her and she says you know you are a true magician now and you've got to be happy with that and he's like well I don't know if any man really knows if he really is ever happy but he thinks he is and he tries to apologize to the unicorn for uh, turning her human and getting her to know what regret feels like and what love feels like but she she says you know I'm glad that you did because it would made it able for us to save the rest of the unicorns and as long as the other unicorns are back in the world that she can be happy and she's been away from her forest for so long that she's kind of scared to go back but she does finally leave and go back to her forest and that's pretty much where the movie ends and I know with other movies I said I wouldn't really spoil too much about what goes on in them and things like that but this is just one of those movies where oh good lord I've been going on for about 54 minutes about it if you can't tell I love this movie and the art style of it 
is kind of like a mixture of American art style and Japanese art style where it's like an American anime type thing almost in the same vein as like uh, The Legend of Korra or the Hobbit animated movie and things like that so it's just even hearing all of what does basically happen throughout the movie hearing about it and seeing it are two totally different things um, like I said in one of the other videos where they were talking about watching a Friday the 13th movie and seeing an axe to the face you know you can hear that somebody gets an axe to the face but seeing it is a totally different thing and hearing what this story is about and seeing it are going to be two totally different things because this movie really helped me to kind of believe that there is magic in the world and I really do think there is but it's the adventure that happens along the way it's the different bumbling moments with the wizard it's the fun moments with the cat because there's a few other times that the cat shows up at the end. Um, the different points in time with Prince Lear trying to get the affection of Lady Amalthea, the weird fun with the different uh, thieves and Captain Cully and everything else, it's, and seeing Mommy Fortuna and her... Um, and all of her conjured up creatures that she's made and seeing what they look like it's just it's a fun ride and to me that's what makes it worth it and in a weird way that's kind of what the movie the first pirates of the caribbean was the curse of um the curse of the black ship um Watching Pirates of the Caribbean felt so much like being on the ride because there was so much on that ride that happens in the movie and then suddenly an hour and a half has gone by with that and it only feels like you're on the ride for like, what, a half hour somewhere around there-ish? So it's just one of those rides where it's so much fun to go through and see the different scenery hear the music because the music is definitely another thing that sticks out in the movie and america did a great job with the music there and even like i said with the song that prince lear sings to lady amaltia later on hearing that is just so much fun and with this movie you could sit down by yourself you could sit down with your kids i think because there's not really much scary or anything that happens in it, you know. Really, the scariest thing, I think, is like the Red Bull and how he makes you feel. Or sometimes bits and pieces with the talking skeleton is kind of freaky. But it's, it's just such a wholesome, fun story. And it falls so nicely into those fantasy movies where they're just so much fun to watch and you get lost in the scenery and everything else much like the movie Mio and the Land of Far Away which I'm going to watch again at some point and I'll probably do a video on that but like I said too this came about as from me watching some of the old shows that I liked to watch as a kid and it kind of brought up a weird kind of remembrance of what it was like back then and to see how much different it is now with TV and movies and stuff like that especially when it's geared towards children because being an 80s child you know I would wake up in the morning almost as early as I could so I could sit down in front of the TV with my bowl of cereal or my pancakes, which pancakes are definitely one of my favorite things, or Belgium waffles or something like that, um, or a nice bowl of grits, 
and anybody from the south is going to know what grits are, and grits are amazing. But, you know, I would sit down in front of the TV, and I would watch the morning cartoons, and, you know, if you wake up early enough, you have maybe an hour and a half or so before you have to run and catch the bus, or, you know, that's what it was for me. And waking up that early to watch cartoons was always so much fun for me, and I think one of the first ones I really remember waking up on purpose to watch was on USA for quite a while when I was a kid. They did their airing of Sailor Moon, and it was kind of my first introduction into anime, but I just thought that the idea of a talking cat and uh, teenage girls who could change into heroes was just such a cool thing that I wanted to wake up each morning and see what happened. And then it was also one of those points where it's like you, it was a weird thing to make you want the weekdays to happen so you could wake up and see them. And then when the Saturday morning lineup came on, you were happy about that too because there were other cartoons on there that you liked watching. But you would also miss the five day a week show that you would get up early to watch. And there were just so many of those that it, it's hard to really point out a bunch of the ones that I remember watching. And that's why Sailor Moon kind of sticks out. Because that's really one of the ones that I would definitely wake up early to watch. And it's also one of those points where it's like, I know I'm going to sound like some of our parents and some of our grandparents and stuff when I say something like this, but it's like, you know, kids nowadays have it so much easier with their cartoon viewing and their movie viewing and everything else because pretty much everything, if you have the right tools, can be found at the touch of a button. And so you don't have to worry about if you catch the newest cartoon that you want to see or the newest TV show because if you know the right places to look or if you have the right streaming services they're right there available at the, like I said, the touch of some buttons. But back then, you know, with anyone born back then or even before, it was aired once and if you were lucky there would be a a rerun of it later on, or if you were able to, you would have a VCR and a blank tape, and you set it to EP, and you would be able to record as many episodes as you could on one tape, and good lord, EP, that would make it, what, three hours that you would be able to record something on? Oh, man. But you had the morning lineup of cartoons that you would wake up early to see. You would get home from school and all of the different channels would have their own like kids after school programs and then they would have like the family friendly shows where you would be able to sit down with your parents and watch something like Fool's House or like Saved by the Bell and things like that. And there was just the only channel I could really remember where it was basically kids stuff all the time was Nickelodeon. And that's where a lot of my uh, stuff I would watch would be on. Because, like I said earlier, I was talking about getting lost in the Doug episodes. But I can remember also watching things like You Can't Do That on Television, or David the Gnome, or... Um, Legends of the Hidden Temple, Double Dare, things like that where it was just all of this fun stuff geared towards us as kids growing up. And if you also remember with Nickelodeon, that's kind of where Pixar got its whole real early start because I can remember seeing the Pixar thing where the one lamp is hopping into frame and it sees the eye on the Pixar, and it jumps up on that, and it jumps up and down until it squishes it. 
but I originally remember seeing that as the little cartoon where the lamp sees a uh, kind of a beach ball, I believe, and jumps up and down on it, and suddenly the ball deflates underneath it, and that's when it gets really sad. But it's like, you know, there were just so many cartoons back then that I would watch on on that, and Sorry, I'm kind of getting lost in the different shows that I remember watching, and I don't remember all of the names of them. One of them I can remember was a little girl who her dad had went to Australia, I think, for an uh, overseas trip, and came back with two little stuffed koalas. And when the koalas touched noses, they turned into real koalas, and they had some weird adventures there. I don't remember what it's called. I don't recall too many episodes of it, but it's just another one of those ones where it's like it sticks out in your mind, because there are so many cartoons that have come and gone throughout the years, and you might not remember all of them, you might not remember any of it, but like something from the theme song would stick out in your head. Like of course you have the ever fun um, tailspin. You have ducktails. I mean, you, there are just so many cartoons where you had so much fun watching it as a kid, and it sticks out in your head with little bits and pieces. You know, things like I am the terror that flaps in the night and just so many weird little ditties or however you want to put it jingles catchphrases whatever blathering blather skites just so many weird things that would stick in your head when the rest of the episodes probably don't and it just was so fun to kind of go back and revisit some of the shows I grew up with as a kid. Like I said, Doug. And then you have Goosebumps, which Goosebumps was definitely one of my favorite series of books growing up, and R.L. Stein still is one of my favorite authors of all time. Um, growing up with that and reading the Fear Street books when I was older, and the Ghosts of uh, Goosebumps, and all of those fun things. But watching uh, Goosebumps again, and watching um, the Haunting Hour, which was another, at that, I think at one point it was just like a collection of, uh, quick little horror stories that R.L. Stein had put together, and it got turned into a TV show too, and just watching that itself is another really great show, especially if you want to get your kids into horror at a young age. And with with The Haunting Hour, it, it's tricky because, like, I'm guessing maybe someone around, like, 8, 9, 10 would probably be a good age to watch it. And it would definitely have some horror elements that you would recognize from other things. It has an episode where I can definitely tell that it's a Nightmare on Elm Street reference. There's one where it definitely has a Grave Encounters um, take on it, and just so many different ones. And when you get lost in some of those shows, to be able to watch that and to be able to sit down with your kids and watch it, it's definitely fun. And it's something I did with my own pup, and I'm glad I got her. Two of the cartoons I really got her into was uh, Scooby-Doo, and I'm really happy I got her into that. And I'm, I'm such a big sucker for 
mostly anything with dogs. Hello, my name's Lil Wolf, and I was also, like I've said before, born in the year of the dog, so I love most things with dogs. And I remember I had a few of the episodes that I grew up with as a kid from Xbox Live. I had them on my account. So I had um, one where Scooby-Doo and Shaggy and the gang go visit Shaggy's uncle. And there's a Black Knight there that's uh, haunting the place, supposedly. There's one with a creature called the 10,000 Volt Ghost. And it's caused a town to basically become a ghost town. And they gotta figure out what happened there. And there was another episode where it was a takeoff of the Headless Horseman. And those were ones I grew up with on a tape. And I was able to get those onto my Xbox account and put them onto my Xbox. And my daughter grew up watching those. And she just fell in love with Scooby-Doo. And I'm so happy about that. And another one I got her into was Inuyasha. And of course, you know, you have a um, half wolf demon and a half, or a half dog demon and a half human. And so that's another reason that one stuck out to me. And for some reason, my daughter latched onto that cartoon. And she just loved it endlessly. And it was just kind of odd because she never got scared of anything that happened in it. Which was kind of funny because, you know, they have demons in there. They have so many different things that do happen. And it never freaked her out. But then later on, I tried showing her one of the episodes of Goosebumps. And that kind of freaked her out and made her scared. And it's like, but you're not scared of demons on Inuyasha, but you're scared of this. But then again, like with Goosebumps, it's more in kind of the real life, at least to a child's perspective. But, you know, later on she did find Goosebumps, and she found The Haunting Hour, and she fell in love with those. But I'm just really glad that I got my daughter into stuff that I liked, and she liked it. And I didn't have to sit there and watch some of the other cartoons that other kids would force their parents to sit through and watch. And I know it's a long kind of tirade for me, but it was just something that popped into my head because it, it was just interesting to see how far we've come with television and cartoons and just stuff that's supposed to be geared towards kids and how it's all lined up now and how each one of them has their own separate channel now that they can go to and find it. But you know, it was kind of simpler when you would have to wake up early in the morning, eat breakfast, and watch whatever cartoon you're gonna watch. You know, be it like gummy bears, or ducktails, or, you know, all of those. And you would watch that, go to school, come home, you'd watch Saved by the Bell, or Family Ties, or anything like that. And nowadays it's just kind of a for me, it's like a lost art, almost, you know, lining up television so that you could get the most views on something. And it's cool that they have their own channels now where you can go back and watch some of the old cartoons or the new cartoons or whatever, or whatever streaming service you can have. But there was always that little thing where it was fun to be able to say, oh my god, the show's going to be on at like 3 p.m. And it's going to be like the only time you're going to be able to see it until like six months later when they do a rerun of it. Or, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a VCR and be able to record it off of that, which is something you definitely can't do nowadays, too. It's like, oh my god. <sighs> I'm... <laughs> Thank you for putting up with me on this long episode. And, like I said, later on down the road, I'll probably do an episode on uh, Mio in the Land of Far Away, and I'll probably do one on Doug, um, probably on Goosebumps also, and 
a haunting hour. But it was just something that kind of watching the last unicorn and seeing how the old drawings of the cartoon and that and then some of the old cartoons growing up it just kind of popped into my head okay I'm gonna sit down and talk about this I don't know how long it'll be and if you stuck through it this far thank you and let me know some of the cartoons you watched you know when you were waking up in the morning and eating cereal or some of the TV shows you liked watching as soon as you got home from school in between the time of getting home from school having to do your homework and then having to eat and you know maybe later on if I get the inkling to I'll talk about Snick which is definitely another thing and there's always of course the Saturday lineup that they would have we could have some fun with that later on but this episode, I think, has gone on a lot longer than I thought it would because I can't be quiet when I talk about things like The Last Unicorn because, it, again, it is such a good movie. I adore this movie so much. And if you get a chance to, definitely sit down, give it a watch. Watch it with your kids, watch it by yourself, watch it however. I really think you will enjoy it, especially if you like fantasy, especially if you like anime style movies, because the art style is a lot like the anime style, but it's, it's just such a great movie. And again, thank you for following me this far and, you know, sticking with me through my weird I don't know what I'm going to talk about in this week's episode or however many I'm going to do. I'm hoping not to, you know, have another week and a half go by without putting up another video. And later on I might be joining another group who do videos on Thursdays. I'm still kind of thinking about it, but I'm leaning towards yes. And Chris Durham, uh, we'll talk later. But again, thank you, you awesome bipeds, quadrupeds, and even the occasional dinosaurs. Thank you for stopping by my den, and thank you for still stopping by. You guys are so amazing, and you guys are the reason I put this channel together and I do my long tirades on whatever show or podcast or whatever I'm talking about. Without you guys listening, I probably wouldn't be doing this. I'd probably just be sitting down watching another movie or another TV show and getting lost in it. And I want to have you guys do that too. Pick up The Last Unicorn if you can get the chance to. Pick up Mio and Lando Far Away. Um, pick up the animated Hobbit. There are definitely movies you can sit down with your family and watch it and have a good time and especially pick up uh, the Prince the Princess Bride movie because that is definitely another movie you need to watch and have fun with and Ever After is another good one along those lines because the magic that happens within them and the feeling and just the overall acting Everything else is amazing. And I just want you guys to be able to have fun. Take a step back. Take a breath. Take a quick break from the stupid world out there. And, you know, it might not be a stupid world. But it's definitely a rat race. And we all need a breather every now and then. So just take a step back. Breathe. Enjoy a movie. Enjoy a TV show enjoy a podcast and take a breath recharge your batteries and then go out there and face the world I love you guys so much and thank you again so until next time my friends bye bye you awesome bipeds quadrupeds and even the occasional dinosaurs 
ta ta for now. Horizon rising up to me the purple dawn dust demons